In the past, the year is 2013 in Tokyo where, among the bustling streets, a salary man reflects on his life. Acknowledging his deficiencies as a human, he accepts that he has a twisted personality and a complex imagination to complement it. Despite all of those things, he considers himself superior to the incompetent people. He continues his musings about how he has made himself a valuable person while firing an employee. The employee, mentioning his daughter's tuition fee and the loan payments for his house, begs the man to reconsider as being fired would put him under immense financial pressure. Unbothered, the man continued saying L plus ratio and laid down the facts. The employee had skipped work multiple times without a valid reason, and despite the company's orders, his performance was below satisfactory. With that line of thought, the man makes it clear that the company has no reason to keep the employee, and asks him to leave. Later, the man walks through the city, still occupied by his thoughts. In his mind, he thought, as long as he follows the rules, he'll be successful and soon will achieve a high-ranking position in the company. At the subway, while waiting for the train, things take a grim turn when the ex-employee whom the man fired pushes him on the track in front of the incoming train. While falling towards imminent death, the man thinks about how his plans were ruined due to the ex-employee who decided to follow an emotional impulse over reason. He also realizes that he forgot to clear his browser history. Suddenly, time comes to an abrupt stop and a bizarre phenomenon unfolds. One after another, the creatures, frozen in time, begin talking about how humans have lost their sense of morality and respect for God. The man deduces that in the moments preceding his death, God is appearing around him through the people and is probably about to scold him for watching furry hentai. He tells the God that he rejects his existence, leaving the God baffled. He explains that if God existed, he wouldn't have let him fall to his death unjustly. When the God asks the man if he is calling him a devil for letting him die unjustly, the man disagrees and settles on calling him a being X. The god is a bit annoyed at his casualness with a supreme being but decide to reveal that he controls the cycle of reincarnation and causes people to be reborn. Appalled by the man's lack of faith, the god tells him that he will not reincarnate him because reincarnating people without faith is a waste of time, and it is already exhausting for the god to deal with 7 billion people in the world. Trying to defend himself, the man explains that in a world with advanced science, where one's needs are met, there will be no faith since there is no need to cling to a god as everything is provided for them. Hearing this, it gives the god an idea and he decides to reincarnate the man in a time where there is no scientific advancement and places him in dire straits so that he may learn the value of faith and he warns him that there will be no second reincarnation if he dies again. With that, he wakes up in another world in the year 1913, as a child named Tanya being cared for by a nun. Tanya grows up in a poor orphanage in a very similar country to a European nation in her previous world. With a wide disparity between the rich and the poor, and because of that Tanya led a very rough life in the orphanage. Tanya thought to herself that living in a country that was gripped with madness that precedes war, she thought that it would be impossible for a poor, powerless girl to survive. But luckily in this world the concept of magic existed. One day, Tanya in her physical exam, Tanya showed an incredible aptitude for magic and was bound to be conscripted into the army. When the flames of war engulfed the nation, Tanya decided to voluntarily join the army as a career choice rather than wait to be conscripted. Since being X told her that she wouldn't be reincarnated again, she devoted herself to surviving and rising through the ranks, aiming to secure victory for her nation to spite and take revenge on being X. Her excellent performance gets her entrusted with training new students in just a year. Although the soldiers make fun of her age and size at first, they soon realize how ruthless she is. At one point, she ends up almost killing a soldier in an attempt to discipline him, but luckily Lieutenant Colonel Rurujan stepped in just in time. Before she can graduate, at the age of nine, she is deployed to the Northern Mountains as a final part of her training. During her training, the Entente Alliance attacks and mobilizes its army across the border. There, Tanya is promoted to second lieutenant and made an observer mage, and her job is to relay enemy positions so that the artillery can fire at that exact position. The enemy forces get completely overwhelmed by the Empire's might, and so, the enemies decide to attack the Empire observer mage, that is Tanya, to regain their footing in the war. Meanwhile, Tanya relishes the fact that her first mission turned out to be so easy that it is incredibly one-sided. She continues her mission but notices that the radio transmission from the control center is being interfered with. The enemy briefly cuts down communication and launches an attack on Tanya, hoping to isolate and take her out. Tanya skillfully evades and, when she regains communication, she relays the sudden attack. 
The higher-ups order Tanya to delay the enemy till support arrives in 600 seconds. Hearing this, Tanya gets frustrated and asks permission to retreat from the battleground, only to be denied and instructed to fight as God is on their side. Refusing to accept God's existence and being annoyed, Tanya turns back and resolves to fight the enemy mages who attacked her. She charges toward the enemy with a burst of maniac laughter, celebrating her chance to finally seize glory and distinguish herself by killing the enemies. The aerial duel begins and with one masterful evasive maneuver after another, Tanya slowly chips away at the enemy numbers. The enemy commander watches in horror as she grabs onto one of the men and seemingly self-destructs with a magic explosion taking out all mages in proximity. Turns out Tanya did this on purpose to leave the fight while making it seem that she fought hard. The reinforcements arrive, and the enemy retreats. Later, in the medical room, the badly injured Tanya is surrounded by soldiers and one of them announces that due to Tanya's incredible valor and skill, she is awarded the Silver Wing Assault Badge. Applause echoes in the room, and Tanya realizes she's being treated as an ace and hopes she won't be sent back to the front lines, as that was her goal all along as she really dislikes killing but she had to be in the army so that she can survive in this new world and have her revenge on being X. After recovering from her injuries, Tanya is given her new deployment orders. Being the ace of the empire, the exceptional soldier who earned the Silver Wings badge at just the age of nine. Therefore the higher-ups don't want to deploy her on the front line so that they can keep up their formidable appearances towards the enemies. Tanya is overjoyed to hear this, as she is being assigned to the tactical instructor squad back home. Trying to hide her joy in getting a safe and comfortable spot, she pretends to be not satisfied but happily agrees. She also finds out that she'll be testing a new prototype computation jewel. Testing the thing out in the air, her joy of a comfortable deployment fades away as she struggles to control the incredibly powerful prototype. Remembering back the briefing she got from the scientists about the jewel, Illinium Type 95, she was told that this revolutionary jewel uses tremendous amounts of magical power. According to the scientist, Tanya should have no problem with it since she has an extraordinary amount of energy. No problem my ass wonders Tanya as she swirls through the air like a drunk isekai truck driver. The device is clearly unstable, and Tanya insists on aborting the testing. The chief engineer, however, firmly disagrees and blames Tanya for simply not concentrating harder. He is convinced that his invention is revolutionary and refuses to back down. Tanya gets furious and she tells him that his delusional is worse than a mid-girl calling herself a baddie and cuts the magic supply, only to end up caught in an explosion anyway. Fuming, she lands and drops her equipment, angrily walking back to her room with the chief engineer behind her arguing like an annoying wife. Tanya calls his invention defective junk and tells him that though she agrees that it is theoretically revolutionary, but it still has a lot of flaws, and he needs to improve them, slamming the door behind her after saying that he'd understand if he had lived longer. The chief engineer just stands there wondering why a nine-year-old imp just told him that, knowing full well that his dog is older than her. Tanya writes a letter requesting a transfer as she would much rather be on the front lines than be a lab rat. The officials end up approving her request and cancelling the project, cutting all funding to it and deeming the jewel too unstable and unreliable for use. That night, Being X animates as a toy soldier and confronts the overjoyed Tanya. He accuses her of not having changed a bit and still having no faith. He questions why Tanya, despite everything, won't call him for help. His questions are only met with sassy rejections by Tanya who browses the atheism subreddit quite often, and is practically a neckbeard keyboard warrior. Being X decides that maybe she needs a blessing to change her mind and once she gets a miracle, she'll gain faith. Tanya breaks the toy, labeling miracles to be nothing more than glorious misunderstandings. The next morning, she wakes up and figures that it was all a dream. However, she finds a piece of paper with Deus Lo Volt, meaning God wills it, written on the paper. Later, Tanya gets ready for one more last experiment, and while putting on her equipment, bickers with the chief engineer, telling him that his passion would be better suited elsewhere. With that, Tanya blasts off, gaining altitude at high speeds but the jewel starts to destabilize again. Knowing this, the chief engineer assures Tanya that their success is guaranteed as last night he had a divine inspiration, where a god talked to him and gave him an idea. In his mad passion, he is ready to have faith and pray to God or die as a martyr in the process. Tanya realizes that being X is behind it all but it's too late. The jewel rapidly destabilizes and the safety mechanisms to turn it off did not work at all. And on the verge of a deadly explosion, being X freezes time again and reveals to Tanya that he has blessed the jewel by stabilizing it and performed a miracle. 
but there is a catch. Tanya must praise God every time she wishes to use it, hoping it'll eventually fill her heart with faith. Time starts and while plummeting to the ground, Tanya unknowingly praises God and prays to him. The jewel stabilizes and she begins gaining altitude, shocking all the other scientists. Tanya is impressed by the power but considers the jewel is a curse because she truly dislikes praying to God. While the chief engineer walks away satisfied, saying Deus lo volt and proclaiming his faith. Back in the present, hellfire rains down upon the battlefield in the form of enemy cannon fire. The soldiers lay anxious in the trenches, waiting for orders, facing the threat of imminent death. The cannon's fierce assault relents, and they get their orders and march forward, only to be met by enemy fire. They valiantly charge forward but to no avail. It is an absolute massacre at the hands of the enemy. The soldiers, screaming in agony, are saved by the reinforcements, a squadron of mages who, with their magic, manage to rescue them back to the trenches. The situation is bleak, but the orders are absolute, they have to keep the enemy at bay, even at the cost of their lives. Among the mages who are providing air support, Tanya aims at the enemy ranks and with one charged explosion spell, lays waste to the enemies of the fatherland. Amid the downpour of shells and bullets, she emerges victorious and she gives motivation and hope to those under her command. In a world steeped in warfare, one nation, known as the Empire, was considered the big daddy of all other nations due to its exceptional military and industrial prowess. Coupled with the countless brilliant minds and mages, the Empire became synonymous with victory. However, it was surrounded by potential enemies on its borders. To overcome this, the military came up with Plan 315, a strategy where border forces delayed enemy advances and bought time for the highly mobile main force to come to defeat the enemy on every side of the border. At least that was the plan. At the Imperial Strategic Headquarters, the generals discuss the dire circumstances like a bunch of beta nerds. Plan 315 is no longer viable as they've already lost half the troops they deployed trying to buy time. Not only that, the main force faces too many delays, too often. They lament knowing that a major offensive against the Entente Alliance was a mistake. They brainstorm strategies and one of them mentions that Ryan has become a living hell because of the conflict. Meanwhile, at Ryan, the soldiers march, filled with dread, and Tanya observes the battlefield, flying high with her magic. She spots enemy soldiers and orders the other mages in the air to open fire. Noticing the artillery firing upon them, two mages, Harold and Cursed, under Tanya's command rush to destroy it. Tanya sternly orders them to retreat as their mission is to only buy time but the soldiers disregard her orders and continue. Though they succeed in destroying the artillery, they earn a little spanking from Tanya and her wrath. Later that night, Tanya calls them and announces that they're being sent back home, calling it a light punishment. She makes it clear that the army does not need soldiers who can't follow orders. Harold and Cursed refuse to accept the dismissal, infuriating Tanya. She grabs hold of her sword and calls out their disobedience, but luckily Victoria steps in, calming Tanya down. Tanya withdraws, saying she'll reconsider her decision but won't let this go unpunished. And the next morning, Victoria is glad when she finds out that those two have been sent to the rear camp on standby, knowing that they'll be safe there instead of facing Tanya's wrath. Later, amidst another heated battle, Tanya tells Victoria to stop slacking off but suddenly her tone shifts, asking her to call an emergency meeting. In the meeting, they find out that the 403 Company Artillery Observers have come under attack from enemy mages, and because of this they can't use artillery to fight the enemy, as they cannot detect them without their observers. Tanya proposes a delaying to rescue the observers because rescue may be difficult as the observer hunters are difficult to deal with. Moreover, she adds that Victoria is at her limit and cannot fight further. Hearing this, Victoria, with her wounded pride, urges the company commander to let her go. Despite Tanya trying to dissuade them, Victoria gets the go-ahead to participate in the rescue mission by the commander. Elsewhere, the 403 company observers are pinned down by enemy mages who are gunning them down without mercy. The observers try to hide in the trenches but the enemy commander, arrogant and sure of his victory, orders his men to fire a wide area explosive spells with maximum output to completely wipe out the trenches and the observers. Tanya and her rescue party arrive late, and all observers are dead. But instead of turning back, Tanya decides to eliminate the enemy. Victoria is baffled, wondering how their single unit could take out an entire enemy company. But Tanya assures her that it will be easy since the enemy has used up most of their firepower to eliminate the observers. 
but Tanya knows that she might lose a few of her troops and that might hurt her promotion. So, she orders her platoon to rendezvous with Lieutenant Schwarzkopf to provide support to her, and she engages against three enemies platoon alone by herself. With a demonic gleam in her eyes, she fights them and completely overwhelms the enemy, killing them off one after another in aerial combat. She demands the enemies that they stand down, leaving Victoria in awe of her patriotism. When negotiations fail, she warns her allies to prepare for impact and begins casting a massive spell. With her incantation complete, she fires off the charged bullet, eviscerating the enemy in a huge explosion. The fight ends and the rescue party is left in shock and surprise of Tanya's powers and reliability. In the enemy capital, a lieutenant reveals that a single mage wiped out their 106th company. She was first sighted two months ago, and in that short span of time, Tanya has earned the nickname as the Devil of the Rhine among enemy troops. Elsewhere, at the Empire's Strategy and Operations Department, everyone celebrates the fact that the reinforcements made it just in time. Just then, Lieutenant Colonel Rarujan's face turns pale when he reads the report that Tanya de Gurachaf was sent to Ryan Theater. Horrified, he expresses concern and calls her a monster in the form of a girl. Meanwhile, Victoria learns that Kirst and Harold are dead after an enemy bombed the pillbox. So, she goes to inform Tanya but finds out that she had already anticipated that and sent them there on purpose. The moment she hears that, a chill runs up her spine, as she watches in horror as Tanya smiles menacingly. The next year, 1924, Tanya is again on the front lines, cursing the need to pray to God just to use the jewel and survive the hellish battle. Back at the headquarters, going over Tanya's accomplishments, everyone agrees that she is the ideal soldier. But Lieutenant Colonel Rarujan still is cautious due to her manic personality, and the latent danger that lies, as Tanya is the only one who can use the advanced jewel. Seeing this, they decide to send her to officer training so she'll have to attend a military academy in the capital. Meanwhile, Victoria, complaining to herself about the harsh conditions, immediately sits up when Tanya comes to her. Taking a seat, Tanya informs her that she recommended Victoria for officer training. Victoria is happy to be sent back to the cozy capital but is worried that the vindictive smurf Tanya will get her bombed and killed like she did earlier to Kirst and Harold. Tanya stands up telling her bitch please you're not even worth killing and leaves. While Tanya is waiting for her transport, Lieutenant Schwarzkopf comes to see her off. Turns out that Tanya only recommended Victoria for a promotion to keep up the front of a superior officer who cares for her troops. Meanwhile, headquarters reviews the war situation and realizes that their main force lacks adaptability and mobility. They conclude the need for a rapid response unit. Tanya, on the other hand, celebrates thinking about the easy life that awaits her in the capital, not knowing that being X has another plans for her. The clock strikes 6 in the morning, and Tanya wakes up to a serene morning. She gets dressed in her uniform, puts on her Silver Wings badge, and makes her way to the military university. It has been six months since Tanya got enrolled in the university, and everything has been going perfectly. Her goal of a cozy life is well within her reach. She enjoys her studies and has an easy time fitting in despite being the youngest one there. Her accomplishments and experience on the front lines have earned her the respect of many other soldiers. Class begins, and the teacher asks a question. The first student gives an emotionally charged answer that angers the teacher, who asks him to sit down. Tanya is asked the same question, and her nuanced, rational answer leaves the teacher impressed. With that, the class ends, and while the other students make their way out, Tanya stays seated on her bench, takes her rifle out, and begins cleaning it. Captain Uger approaches Tanya and inquires why she is always working on her rifle. Tanya immediately responds that as a soldier who has seen battle, she feels uneasy without her rifle. Hearing this, Captain Uger leaves, not wanting to disturb her and acknowledging that Tanya is the ideal soldier. Of course, that answer was just to keep appearances. In reality, Tanya keeps her rifle ready in case she gets a chance to shoot being X. Later, in the library, Tanya has trouble reaching a book on the shelf due to her height. While she struggles, a man comes around, takes the book, reads the title, and compliments Tanya on her dedication to her studies. Seeing the man's caller, Tanya realizes that the man is a high-ranking general, and immediately salutes him. The man introduces himself as Zedor, the Vice Director of Strategy and Operations. Knowing the reputations that Tanya holds, Zedor decides to ask Tanya to come with him, and Tanya readily agrees, seeing this as an opportunity to further secure a cozy future. 
in Zetter's office. He asks Tanya about her opinions on the ongoing war and the future that awaits them. Tanya, cunning as always, takes the diplomatic approach and says that the question is too broad. Therefore, Zetter rephrases his question to ask specifically what the next developments in the war will be. Tanya, once again, tries to avoid a direct answer, but when Zetter insists, she tells him that the ongoing war would develop into a much larger war that is the World War. She justifies her reasoning by saying that the Empire is a newly established global power with incredible military superiority, so the other nations would see that as a threat and do their utmost to not allow the Empire to win the war and take over the Republic. The major powers like the Allied Kingdom and the Russi Federation would simply not allow that to happen. When asked how Tanya would deal with that problem, she gives another nuanced answer that she'd try to begin to talk to the other countries at early stage, and, if that fails, she will focus on limiting the Empire's expenditure of resources. Zetter interprets this as Tanya wouldn't try to win the World War, and that causes her to panic, thinking that she messed up and gave the wrong answer. Just then, she manages to clarify herself, saying that what she meant was she'll try to win the war in the long term by saving resources. Zetter then asks her for a practical plan and, trying not to sound like a coward, Tanya suggests a mixture of defensive plans with the infantry and offensive strategies using mages. Zetter finds this answer fascinating, while Tanya basks in her sly answers, thinking she should try being a lawyer after the war. Thinking that her plan might work, Zetter orders Tanya to make a formal proposal for the Battalion of Mages, so she can do a trial run of her plan. Later on the train, Rurujan reads the anonymous proposal presented by Zetter and his eyes almost pop out in horror. Still, he finds the possibility of a world war a very real threat, and agrees with the rational arguments in the proposal, though he suspects that it was written by Tanya. Sometime later, at a cafe, Tanya peacefully enjoys her coffee, taking joy in the fact that things are going as planned. At this rate, an easy life after graduation is a guarantee. Luger walks into the cafe, and after seeing Tanya, sits down to chat with her. Seeming troubled, Uger asks Tanya why she joined the military at such a young age. Tanya, spinning up another bullshit sob story, says that her father was a soldier and her mother abandoned her, leaving her with no place but to join the military. Uger expresses concern that children so young shouldn't be on the battlefield. Now that he has a daughter, he feels concerned about the future of his family, thinking that maybe his daughter will have to go to war as well. Hearing this, Tanya manages to persuade him that he needs to fight harder to live, so that his daughter won't have to join the military. He agrees and with that Uger leaves, and Tanya, with a demonic smile, enjoys that she has gained yet another supporter. At the same time, Zetter presents Tanya's proposal to General Kurt von Rudersdorf. During a strategic headquarters meeting, they deliberate on the achievements in the Rhine Theater compared to the setbacks in the Western Theater as it was nearly destroyed. Therefore, Zetter introduces Tanya's strategy for a swift response mage battalion, which initially makes the others hesitant. But they approve it, after Zetter argues that one battalion won't be much of a loss to them and the need for a rapid response is essential. He even says that he knows the perfect person who has the proper mental ability to lead the battalion. While Rurujan is fuming with anger when he finds that Tanya's plan has been implemented with her in command. He objects based on Tanya's behavior, mentioning the incident at the academy, but is informed that the others think Tanya has grown as a person as a result of the military university, which he denies stating that a person cannot change that easily. At night, Tanya is invited for dinner at the headquarters where she receives congratulations on being one of the 12 knights at such a young age. They eat their meal, while Tanya thinks that the food looks like a dog diarrhea. Shortly after, they get to the point to discuss Tanya's post-graduation deployment. They offered her a list of safe deployments where after two years of experience she could be promoted to the strategic department. But that was all just for show. They bamboozle her, and Zetter clarifies that he wants to put her in charge of the new mage battalion. Tanya's face turns pale realizing that all her smart-ass yapping landed her in a much more dangerous position than even the front lines. She tries to weasel her way out by saying that she isn't qualified to lead a battalion, but Zetter tells her not to worry because after she graduates she will be promoted to captain, then an organizer, and soon promoted even further, so quit whining. She is told to organize a battalion by choosing 48 people as soon as possible. Tanya, having no other choice, accepts and takes her leave. Before she can leave, Zetter cautions her that she has a bad reputation and wishes her good luck. Tanya walks out begrudgingly, deciding that she'll delay the deployment by taking as much time as she can in the selection process. 
to her dismay. Tons of mages apply to get in her battalion, despite her best efforts to make it as unappealing as her face. She tries to use the piles of applications as an excuse to buy more time, but Victoria shows up, assigned to assist her. Victoria is Tanya's new assistant, and she immediately gets to work, much to Tanya's dismay, and speeds up the process. Victoria even asks the headquarters for more workers to get through the applications faster already, leaving Tanya regretting having such a talented assistant. The recruitment process begins, and Tanya deliberately sets up a very difficult test that most applicants end up failing. She uses an illusionary spell to try and trick the applicants into leaving. The test is that only those who deduce that it's an illusion will pass. So far, out of 39 sets of applicants, 33 have been deceived into going back to their home units. She gives Zetter a demonstration and though he agrees with her, he tells her that the passing standard is simply too high. Tanya asks for more time to re-educate the applicants and devise a new acceptable standard. Her timeline of only a month to re-educate the soldiers shocks everyone but Zetter doesn't care and approves her request, allowing complete freedom even if she has to get a little rough. The hellish training begins with the soldiers' wake-up call being artillery shells, instead of an alarm. Victoria sees this coming while the applicants are completely terrified of Tanya. With that, Tanya fires off a flare to mark the beginning of the defensive training. The mages have to survive the shelling for 36 hours, a task that some of them consider completely insane. They begin digging holes to hide from the relentless fire while some try to block the shells thinking that they're just training rounds. With a maniac smile, Tanya reveals that real explosive shells are in the mix too, making Victoria wonder if she had to go to such extreme lengths. 36 hours later, the mages managed to survive in a miserable state, and Tanya announced that it was just step one of their training. The next step is to traverse the difficult, snowy, terrain and reach a designated point without using any magic at all. She sternly warns them that if she detects any magic, she'll fire magical bullets at them. The soldiers begin their march and spot all sorts of thorns in their path, from army dogs to bomber planes. One soldier, in his frustration, screams out cursing Tanya but that ends up causing an avalanche. That completely covers them up, but somehow most of them survive. But some soldiers end up in a near-death situation. So, Tanya shows up and gives one soldier, who isn't breathing, some first-class first aid. A swift kick to the stomach so hard that he comes back to life. She does this to encourage the soldiers to drop out, but they end up more determined to continue the training as they were completely terrified of her. A month passes by, and despite Tanya's efforts to make the soldiers drop out, the soldiers somehow survive the training and become a part of her battalion as Imperial Mages, where she had no choice but to give them an amazing speech, motivating them that all the members of the battalion are brothers from this day onwards, and will fight together for the Empire, because if the Empire lives forever that means they lived forever too. Completely exhausted, Tanya received a message from the headquarters. She meets up with Rurujin who congratulates her on her promotion to the rank of a major. As they were talking a heated argument ensues over the orders Tanya received for her battalion to be immediately deployed to the southeastern garrison, to the dukedom of Dacia. Tanya argues that she needs at least six more months to fully train the soldiers, but Rurujin insists that the inspector have deemed more than capable of being deployed immediately. Besides that, all the members of the battalion are using prototypes of the next generation Alenium Type 7, and they have completed adaption training at 8,000 meters, and he thinks that they are more than ready. He further argues that due to the stalemate in Rhine, the army didn't have time and needed to gain an advantage. Despite Tanya's multiple objections, the orders are absolute and she has no choice but to obey. With that, Rurujin takes his leave and on his way out, he advises Tanya to learn the Dakian language. After deployment, Tanya is informed that a Dakian military unit has invaded the Empire's borders. She asks for details and is baffled to find out that the army of 600,000 men, with no air support, and they are so stupid that they are not encrypting their communications. Finding out that their military tactics are old and stupid, Tanya gathers her battalion and with an evil smile, tells them that it's time for a massacre. With guaranteed air superiority, it's less of a war and more like bullying a bunch of fat ginger kids. While the battalion plays whack-a-mole with their magic bullets and the heads of the enemy soldiers, Victoria remarks how she thought the battle would be a lot more difficult than it turned out to be as usually speaking. Because Tanya's definition of easy is like wiping your ass with sandpaper instead of toilet paper. Tanya at first gives her a death stare and later agrees that the enemy does not even deserve to be considered a threat. 
Just then, Tanya notices something peculiar on the battlefield. The enemy soldiers are taking formation to fire back at the mages. Tanya knows that their dumb tactics won't work because an infantry bullet cannot hit a mage as they have their magic shield to protect them. But as she glances at her battalion trying to fall back and be defensive, this sets her off in a fury, announcing that the mages will die by her hands if they get hit by enemy fire. With that, Tanya joins in with the remaining mages and literally carpet bombs the area using grenades. The enemy retreats and Tanya hunts them back to their headquarters. Tanya and her battalion get surrounded by enemy soldiers but Tanya tells the enemies, call an ambulance, but not for me, and begins provoking the enemy commander. In their rage, the commander opens fire only to be blocked by the magic shields. Tanya has her battalion wipe out everyone except the enemy commander. They ransack the whole headquarters to send everything of value back to the Empire. After that, one of the mages inquires if they should wipe out the remaining soldiers. Tanya tells them to leave that to the allied air forces that are en route and will be there shortly. Instead, they'll be advancing further, to the enemy capital. They find a Republic-backed weapons factory in the capital of Dacia, and Tanya begins scheming. Victoria suggests to attack them immediately, but is met with criticism by Tanya that they aren't barbarians who'd ignore the international wartime law that requires them to issue a warning so the enemies may evacuate before attacking a factory. The entire battalion looks at Tanya in shock, because they were surprised to see that this evil chimp who has probably committed every crime there is, but this is where she draws the line. At any rate, Tanya uses her childlike voice to issue the warning that makes the army forces think that it's just a kid trying to prank them. They laugh it off, but the mage battalion charges their shots up, in sync with Tanya. Together they fire off a powerful and destructive energized bullets, destroying the factory. With this victory, the battalion returns back. The strategic headquarters is delighted to learn of the advancements made in Dacia by Tanya's battalion. Zetter still cautions them that they're fighting on two different fronts with the Republic and Entente Alliance. Worrying about a possible world war, they know that fighting too many enemies at once is a foolish strategy. So they decide to wipe out the weaker enemies like Dacia first and then turn towards the Entente Alliance as it is weaker than the Republic. The problem lies with the fact that they're low on supplies. Though they can take over Dacia by winter, they're not sure if the supplies will arrive on time as the railroads are slowed due to snow, and they're already using the port systems and railroad to their limits. Surviving the winter is all they can afford to do with the limited supplies they have. An offensive attack is out of the question unless they use Tanya's battalion because her ugly face is offensive enough to scare the enemy away. Tanya gets the orders and briefs her battalion that they'll be leaving for the Northern Front to fight against the Triple Entente who have launched multiple attacks on the Empire in the past. She warns them that this won't be as easy as Dacia and also intends to use a new tactic. She instructs her lieutenant, Weiss, to brief the soldiers on the remaining details and makes her way out. Victoria follows along, and Tanya brings her attention to the odd fact that despite the Empire's superiority, they haven't been able to defeat the Entente Alliance yet, she remarks that they must have support from the other nations. Victoria agrees, and Tanya furthers her point that the World War seems very likely. The abnormal rate at which things are advancing makes Tanya suspect being X for pulling the strings and orchestrating the war. At the Entente Alliance Capital's Ministry of Defense, their Council of Ten discusses the development in the war. It turns out that they are indeed being helped by the Republic who is not only aiding them but also monitoring the Empire's moves. With no choice left but to take aid from the Republic and the fear of meeting the same fate as Dacia did, they are resolute to give it their all and win. At the Imperial Northern Region's supply base, supplies to last the winters are being loaded up when in a blink, enemies attack. A battalion of mages of an unknown nationality completely catches the Empire's mages by surprise and starts mercilessly mowing them down. With no option of retreating, the Empire's forces are ready to die defending the supply base as without it the Empire won't be able to survive the winter. One after another the mages fall and to make matters worse, the enemy bombers enter the fray with a relentless assault of machine gun fire. Tension runs high till, but like a blessing from God, Tanya's battalion arrives and the other mages are ordered to retreat. Tanya begins the attack by commanding two units to pincer the enemy, and the other unit to strike from the rear. Tanya gains altitude to get the upper hand in the air battle, and she informs the headquarters that they don't need any reinforcements. At first, the command considers it some sort of arrogant stupidity, but when the lieutenant general sees the altitude and speed of Tanya's battalion, 
he's dumbfounded and realizes that this battalion might be the Empire's ace. Because no ordinary mages could achieve such speeds and bear the pressure to fly at such high altitudes. That is more than 8,500 kilometers. Back in the battle, the enemy mages are skilled and equipped with good equipment, enough to keep up with Tanya's battalion. Tanya announces to them that failure is not an option here as the entire world is watching them, and the Empire's pride and honor rests upon their shoulders. To make things more fun, she says that whichever unit contributes the least will be paying the most for the victory celebrations, adding that she already ordered an elite 25-year-old booze. That's why if they don't want to go bankrupt they need to fight hard. The enemy bombers are finally in sight and are being escorted by their mages. Tanya orders Victoria to lead the unit and take care of the mages while she goes after all the bombers. The enemy pilots consider it suicide for a single mage to try and attack them but Tanya, maneuvering masterfully through the barrage of machine guns, takes out the leader of them with ease. Tanya shoots more of them down and the remaining bombers retreat. She orders her battalion to wipe out the rest of the forces and rushes to interrogate the pilots of the plane she shot down. There she finds it too late as they're already dead but when she turns around, being X, animates as one of the corpses and asks Tanya what it is like taking part in a world war. Tanya shoots the corpse multiple times in anger and immediately flies away. She finds a little enemy safe house in the woods where they're observing and documenting her. To prevent important information from reaching the enemy, Tanya charges up a devastating long-range spell and destroys the safe house. Later, in the Republican capital, General Pierre Michelot Lugo is briefed by Lieutenant Colonel Zevran Biantot regarding the Entente Alliance's dire state and the losses suffered by Republic mages. Biantot recommends against further deployment of Republic mages to the Entente Alliance, but Lugo, appearing entranced, refuses and tells him that they'll use what they can. At the Northern Forces Command Center, General Rudersdorf welcomes Tanya back and congratulates her on her impressive work on the battlefield. Getting to work, Rurujan explains that Tanya's next task is to take out an enemy defensive placement. Tanya raises concern, mentioning that an offensive attack with their current supply system seems illogical but Raguran avoids revealing more information and advises Tanya to simply do as she's told. General Rudersdorf says that Tanya is a pivotal piece in navigating this messy world war, and Tanya assures him that any nation that meddles with them will learn their lesson. In the Entente Ministry of Defense, Anson Su, the guy who led the company of mages against the Empire in the North, has been promoted to the rank of Colonel. One of his men congratulates him on the promotion but Anson Su isn't very happy about it. He is worried about his family and tells him that in this dire situation, the only reason he was promoted was because his senior officer died. Later, Anson Su bids farewell to his daughter and wife. He expresses his regret for not being a better father but explains to his daughter, Mary, that the war is likely to reach the city soon and the best thing they can do to stay safe is to leave the country. The ship leaves and Mary and her mother wave goodbye with tears in their eyes. Major Gunner shows up and hands General Su the gift Mary left for him. Opening the case, Anson finds the latest submachine gun and questions why his daughter would give that to him. Major Gunner chimes in, saying it may be because she wants to help her father fight for their nation. The gun has the general's initials carved into it, and General Su can't help but let out a smile. During the Imperial Army Northern Theater Command Strategy Conference, Tanya suggests a strategic withdrawal as opposed to a pointless immediate offensive, but one of the generals there objects to the idea and angrily demands that they go on an offensive mission as the supplies can last them at least three weeks. Tanya disagrees stating that if they continue at this rate they will just put severe stress on their front lines. He takes offense and accuses Tanya of implying that they aren't taking care of their troops. Hearing this, Tanya turns the sassiness to the max and, pouring milk like an unmannered monkey, she retorts saying that the starving soldiers she saw were definitely not cared for, and the general doesn't understand since he lives in such luxury. He calls Tanya a m**** and starts fuming, but Tanya simply leaves. Later, General Rudersdorf and Rurujan hold a private meeting with Tanya and ask for her candid opinion. While analyzing the map for possible strategies, Tanya figures out that the higher-ups are planning to go on an offensive attack as a diversion so that the army forces can enter through the sea at Ors Fjord. Arugin is baffled to see Tanya deduce a top-secret plan with such ease, while Rudersdorf is impressed. With that he explains that her battalion will go in advance of the rest of the landing force, and they will attack at Ors Fjord because the enemy will never expect it.
at Fort Orsfjord. Anson explains to Gunnar the unique terrain and the advantage it brings. Orsfjord is a narrow labyrinth-like area covered by islands and 20 cannons that allow them to attack from any direction. However, he also expresses his dislike that his battalion was deployed there. His attention is caught by some allied soldiers being given a pep talk by an officer. The officers tells the soldiers don't worry about it. You dipshits it'll just be like Fortnite you can respawn and Anson remarks that their country is just sending youngsters to die, adding that is the reason why the adults must continue fighting. Meanwhile, the mage battalion is dropped off by an Empire cargo plane near the Orsfjord to begin the surprise attack. They have 30 minutes to secure victory, and Tanya instructs Victoria that if anything happens to her and Lieutenant Weiss, she should take charge and retreat. She reasons that if the enemy can take her and Weiss out, then the rest of them stand no chance. They begin by taking out the patrol ships and then the cannon emplacements, one after another destroying the cannons. Victoria spots enemy reinforcements, it's a battalion-sized unit of mages. Tanya orders her men to prepare and fight and assures them that they can win despite being outnumbered by telling them that being delusional is the solution. 